Hi everyone, my name's uh, Maggie Blaygrove and I am the founder of Open Minds Active um, and I'm really thrilled to be here to, well, speak to you all, meet you, it's, been, it's going to be amazing. So first, um, before I just talk a little bit about Open Minds, I'm talking today about social prescribing. Can you put your hands in the air, like you just don't care, can you put your hands in the air if you know what social prescribing is? Okay, so that's a fair number. So, um, without going into all of that, <laughs> but social prescribing is quite a new, relatively new phenomenon. Well, it is and it isn't, but it's this holistic approach to care, putting people back in control of their own health, really, and looking at a holistic approach about all the other things that kind of support our health and well-being. So, that will just give you... And it's the NHS have been implementing this and we have been part of a social green social prescribing program for the last um, couple of years as part of a national research pilot and that really has enabled us to kind of continue doing the work that we're doing so anyway what we do we are a CIC so we've been going since about 2019 we are a team of three so it's myself Wafa, who's in this picture here, and Liz. Um, and we have some directors and, that help us and also a lot, loads of volunteers and sessional swim coaches as well. But our mission really is well-being for all using the great outdoors. But we do focus specifically on swimming. Um, and we want to deliver movement-based activities. But our real MO is about this nature connectedness to those less visible. And we really focus on improving... <coughs> excuse me mental health and physical health, and to reduce social isolation. So we're based in Bristol, so we're very urban, but Bristol, any of you Bristol folk here? They get, yeah, there's always one. Um, <laughs> so we are um, a very green city. We have lots of access to green spaces and blue spaces, but we know that so many people do not access those spaces. And I've been working in community development and using sport for social change for over 20 years now. And that's my passion, really, is to open up spaces, opportunities, and physical activity for people who, for whatever reason, don't access that. Um, so our programme, so just quickly what we do. So that's a lot of our team directors and some of our participants in that picture there. So we have our social prescribing, which is wild swimming for well-being. We have a learn to swim programme for global majority women. And we have a range of summer activities that include surfing, SUP, all sorts of stuff. So we're really about getting people out into nature and accessing blue spaces specifically. So those are our sort of three pillars of programmes. Um, and as a CIC, it has been a very rocky journey over the last four years. But I'm pleased to say that we've recently secured two rounds of three-year funding from different organisations, which has changed everything. And a big part of that is to do with the research. Um, which we'll talk about. So, and a massive thank you to um, Hannah and Heather because I know that citing their research and that randomised control trial study has been really influential in us securing local NHS funding. So if anybody wants to talk to me about that and the blood, sweat and tears it took to get it, I'd be happily, happy to. So just to give you a few stats. So um, we run kind of term time, like, so we go September to July, so that's why the numbers look a bit weird. But so far, we've probably, we're into our fourth year of running social prescribing programs now. So we very similar to um, the Outside 2 study, we, we run um, eight-week programs for people um, to come and basically, just like the Outside 2 study. So we introduce them to open water swimming, the skills, and it's all around nature connected, and mental health and well-being and community. So it's not just eight weeks, thank you very much, goodbye. Then we have three intakes of those courses every year. And they, then from that, where we have drop-in sessions every Thursday. So people can continue to come and have that community connect us all year round. So we're not just eight weeks and then that's it. Um, and 30% of our participants are from global majority backgrounds. Bristol is an incredibly diverse, wonderful city. And we realised very early on, myself and Waffa, when we were looking at some of the issues around this, we were like, okay, how come a lot of these women that we know and work with, how come they're not accessing these spaces? So therefore we set up the Learn to Swim programme because we realised that was a huge barrier. 
So, um, and all our women on our Learn to Swim program are from global majority women, and half of those are refugee and asylum seekers. So Wafa herself is a, you can see in the picture there, she is um, a former competitive swimmer from Sudan. So when we met, we were like, yeah, we have some work to do together. Um, and, and it's thanks to her that, you know, we've, we've really engaged a wide reach, wide number of women in these, in these projects. And so, yeah, we've engaged 217 people in nature-based activities in that year, which for three of us and a couple of other sessional staff has, you know, that's been a lot on a shoestring, on an absolute shoestring as well. Um, but not only just, uh, um, we're intersectional in our approach in that it's not just about race and culture, it's about health inequalities. That's a huge driver for us. And 70% of our participants are from areas of Bristol with the highest health inequalities. And the funding that we've just received from the NHS specifically is um, from, it's called ICE, another nice acronym. It's Inner City Central East Bristol. So we specifically target those communities where we know they are not leaving their tower blocks. We know they have no access to green spaces, let alone blue spaces. So that's our focus of our work. And all of our participants referred in have some kind of mental or health condition. Um, we also get referrals. I can talk about social prescribing all day, but I'm talking about barriers today. Um, but we do a combination of outreach into various different community groups. But we also have relationships with around, I think it's about 40 different health centres in that locality. And GPs and link workers and social prescribers refer people to us onto these programmes. And we have, that's taken a long time to build those relationships up with people. And it's taken a long time for them to build trust in what we were doing. So the research part of that is so crucial because without evidencing the increase in wellbeing and mental health, we haven't been, it's a bit chicken and egg. We know that it, they're gonna feel better. We know that they're gonna self-manage. We know there's gonna be all these health benefits. However, we need to prove it. Um, and that's where you lovely researchers come in, because you've helped us a lot. Um, but first, I, I did really want to talk about the barriers today, because I think it's so, it's so, with open water swimming, with wild swimming, we see it, it's not necessarily, it's the most welcoming and wonderful community, but it's not necessarily the most diverse in all its forms. However, it is getting better. But the biggest thing for us is that we realised that loads of the women that we were seeking to engage, and by the way, we're not exclusively women, it's just we're a women-led organisation, led by lived experience, essentially, so that we thought, well, we're going to start with this, and then as we grow, we'll see, we, we, we want to reach as many people as possible, all genders, all backgrounds, but we have to start somewhere. So this is predominantly, we're talking about women at the moment, and those who identify as women. So, um, yeah, we like, okay, well, people can't swim. So that's a huge issue. The second issue is not feeling welcome. So even in the swimming pools, we knew that women were coming to us and saying, we love this session. They didn't believe us. When they said they were come, a lot of the women were coming into the pools, they were like, oh my God, everybody here looks like me, apart from me and a couple of other swim teachers. They were like, we can't believe this. This is unbelievable. We feel so safe. We feel really welcome. We haven't felt welcome before. And you know, and as a, as a white woman who's had access to everything that I've wanted to do, I was like, this is huge. And Wafa was like, yeah, these are the challenges that we need to tackle and that we need to face. So a big part of the work that we do is working with venues to create safe spaces and inclusive spaces. And that is a huge piece of work. Um, and it's ongoing. Um, there's also a big fear of nature. So, even Wafa herself, who's been swimming in rivers in Sudan throughout her childhood, when she came to the UK, she was like, oh, I'm not getting in that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't blame you. So, but we went to Clevedon, and, you know, I made sure I checked on the sewage map that there'd been no sewage releases that day. But she was like, this is incredible. But she said there was a fear for her, a fear of the unknown, a fear of not really understanding these spaces. And again, being the only woman of colour at those spaces. So... She, unfortunately for her, because sometimes I think she feels the weight of that pressure, she is an incredible role model for her community. And um, as a result of her being in involved in the programme and the out outreach work that we've done, we've engaged so many more women. Um, and it's been hard, you know, it's been hard for her 
because you don't necessarily want you she just wants to go for a swim she doesn't necessarily want to be this role model all the time but she en has ended up being that role model um psychological barriers so there's a lot of oh it's not for me you know, I've, I've, you know and, and anxiety, we're working with people that have mental health, depression, anxiety issues. So even just getting them to the session requires a lot of work. We don't just sit there at, at the lake and just be like, oh, they'll be coming up in a minute. It's, you know, it's really, really tricky. Um, so we need a lot of time and resource around that. And we're going to really remote places. The lake we use in Bristol is about 15 minutes away from the city centre. So there was a bus stop at like half a mile away. So we have to ferry people backwards and forwards to the bus stop, which also gives us a bit of a challenge. And also the lack of awareness from the venues that we're using. We're having to do a lot of education around what is a safe space for a lot of the women. And yeah, anyway, I've got literally four minutes left. Quick Maggie, solutions, <laughs> solutions. So community led, because this is what, I want this to be positive. So, um, it's really obvious, but people don't do this, but co-creation is do things with, not to. I see this all the time. Allyship. As a white woman working in a space where there's diversity, I can be a voice, but it's not my experience. So I'm constantly learning how to be a better ally. I acknowledge my bias. I challenge behavior where I see it, and I'm consistent. And I'm always, always learning. Uh, and so are the other swim coaches. And we do an awful lot around EDI training and support, which is led by WAFA and other professionals as well. We have uh, inclusive programs that offer that <coughs> confidence and safety. We have an awful lot of fun. They always know when the Open Minds groups are in because there's raucous laughter. Um, and I think that's probably the same for all, a lot of you that deliver sessions. Um, we have a diverse workforce in all its forms that represent, and we have ambassadors that also represent different, from neurodivergence to disability to all kinds of things. We try and be, we try and be everything to everybody, but I say that like what, within, within a realistic realm. Um, but we go back to basics, so we, we make sure that we have people are able to have the skills in order to be able to go outside. We don't just say to people, like, oh, just come and give it a go in the lake. We tend to, especially if people need that support and they're a nervous swimmer, we kind of support them in the pool first before we take them outside. Um, we're very creative with transport. There's a lot of car shares. There's a lot of phoning up different councils because we're in, like, where the lake is, there's two, three different councils that we speak to, and we're like come on guys, you need to put on a bus, we've got to get these people to there. We have a lot of peer support, so it's women's, women supporting women with lived experience. They advocate for um, the groups, they go to the venues and, and advise the venues, rather than, we don't just expect it all to be on us. Um, we understand mental health, so we're swim coaches, right? That's what we thought. <laughs> and actually, we're multifaceted, multi, doing all kinds of things. So it was really important for us to have um, particular staff training around mental health first aid. Um, we're trauma informed. Um, we have so much training as well as the swim teaching and lifeguarding qualifications. And we empower the individual. So we're all about the person. We don't talk to, if somebody has come, we have very complex cases that come through onto our programs. And we're very much, um, we're, you're a person here just coming to swim. And we focus on that. We focus on the person, not their, what they might see as what's wrong with them or their physical or mental condition, whatever. So final thoughts, one minute, <laughs> um, is um, find some really great researchers to help you evidence this work. That has been so invaluable to us because we had to do that in order to guarantee, in order to evidence and get our funding. So massive thanks to the Outside Two crew because they really helped us secure. I don't, get, don't give up with it. Um, but tackle one thing at a time. Don't try to be all things to all people. Um, we've got to start small and just grow wisely is my key. But also, which I think some of the researchers have spoken to today, is that be open-hearted and open-minded, but also really know your boundaries. We work with some really, really complex individuals. We support them, but it, 
sometimes the trauma and their experiences get put onto the staff and I, for one, always make sure that the staff have supervision. I never thought I'd be doing that as an open, open water coach, but I make sure that they have supervision. Um, and we just are kind to ourselves. And that's why we don't try to do too many of the programs as well. We only run three programs a year because it puts in a lot, but then we're supporting people the rest of the time. That's, I've gone eight seconds over. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone wants to talk to me about funding and stuff, I'm happy, like, I've, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I, I just want to say, um, is there a momentum that you're conscious of your contribution and what you're doing for the group, but do you see within the women participating that they're taking on roles and experiences that actually alleviates your burden with them, yeah. that there's a growth if, if that... Massively, and I think that's about being community-led. Because the women, there was a point last year as well, where I was like, okay, I don't think we can afford to keep going. And the women were like, we'll, don't worry, we'll fundraise. So these were participants. And we had like a cook-off. There was about like, a, I mean, the women love to cook. And the refugee and asylum seekers, we had like 20 different nationalities there, all bought food. And we raised like a thousand pounds in one afternoon. Because they were like, this is our swim program. We need this, this is our service. And we, we take ownership of it. So that's amazing. Um, and they also want to train up as swim teachers, swim coaches, peer mentors. <coughs> they, they own it, really. Any more questions? <coughs> Thank you. I just, I just wondered whether um, access to transport and transport licks is a really big problem that we come up against you know all the time mm. I wonder whether you've got any sort of thoughts on how we how we get around that whether there's an influence for the public transport companies or community-based solutions um, what what do we do when the money runs out yeah so a lot of community transport initiatives in Bristol collapsed after Covid when they were needed the most as part of this green social prescribing network Bristol is very forward in that there's lots of nature-based um, organisations doing this kind of work, not with swimming, but around just access to green spaces. And so we've been looking at a, um, a collective grant to look at reinstating some kind of service in partnership with the council and the West of England Economic Forum or something like that, another acronym, um, to tackle that issue, because it can't just be one project, so we have to work in partnership. But it's a huge challenge for that. And also, we, want pe we don't want people to be using their cars. We want them to be going on um, public transport. And also opening up those blue spaces. So we um, helped open a, uh, did an activist piece around opening Bristol Harbour because we knew that people could cycle there or walk there or get the bus. And we, there's all the pollution issues that come with that as well. All right. All right.